Marianne Williamson. Uh, if you don't know who she is, she's a best-selling author, political activist, and spiritual thought leader. She's written 13 books, including four New York Times number one bestsellers. A Return to Love is probably the most well-known one. Beautiful. Um, I chose a quote to kind of kick us off into the talk about what's happening globally with COVID-19 that really resonated with me and, and kind of what the direction that I feel, you know, moving forward that you can lend guidance in. It's from your book, A Politics of Love. It was love that abolished slavery. It was love that gave women suffrage. It was love that established civil rights. And it is love that we need now. Welcome. Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian independence movement argued that love, the same love that heals personal relationships could also heal political, economic, and social relationships. And it was that philosophy of nonviolence that was the basis of the bloodless revolution by which the Indians were able to get the British out of India. Martin Luther King traveled to India. He studied the principles of nonviolence with uh, of Mahatma Gandhi, and he brought those principles back to the United States for the, uh, to apply to the struggle for civil rights in the 1960s. The idea, as, as Martin Luther King said about Gandhi, that he was the first person to take the ethic of love and lift it beyond interaction to large-scale political and social force for good. So what we're talking about here is a, an expansion. It's not really a transition because it's not going from one thing to another. It's from going one to, from one thing to a larger application of that thing, which is the idea that the same principles of spiritual and personal transformation, following the guidance of being a good person, ethics, character, conscience, trying to live our lives in service and in love. The idea is that that same principle can be applied to public policy. And when it is not applied to public policy, when public policy is instead dominated by a very amoral, not immoral, but amoral economic theory, where love isn't considered a factor, when compassion isn't considered a factor, conscience isn't considered a factor, all that's considered a factor is short-term profit, then what happens is very terrible things. For instance, in the COVID crisis, that virus did not uh, originate in the United States. But when it got to the United States, we were horrifically underprepared. And we were underprepared because neither our healthcare system nor any other range of public investment had been set up to handle a problem that would hit us collectively. Those systems have been set up, particularly in the last few decades, to basically protect people who could afford to be protected, which is essentially 1% of Americans at the expense of most everyone else. And so we are getting back the consequences of the fact that too many of us, while we have certainly tried to live good lives as individuals, have chronically disconnected from political issues, just hoping somebody else was handling it or thinking, well, the change doesn't happen there. Well, maybe the cause doesn't, but the effects sure do. And I think that's a real transformation in our thinking. That's why in the quote that you mentioned, those were big political movements, women's suffrage, civil rights, abolition, but they were all motivated, inspired, and fueled by the love that people were able to feel, not only for other people, as in the case of abolition and civil rights, but also their own well-being and the well-being of their daughters, as in the case of women's suffrage. So you can't leave love out of the public conversation and keep it only to the private and have things be okay. Yeah. And so, you know, this event was titled A, a New Path Forward. And love, love surely must play <clears throat> a bigger part in our collective new path forward. Um, how, how can we unpack that a little bit and, you know, really shift our perspective <clears throat> collectively. I think one of the things that people who are involved in higher consciousness and personal transformation do is we don't want to go near the topic of economics. We go near the topic of money, a lot actually that, that community does, 
but it's always within the context of how I might make more money. We're into the entrepreneurial conversation and all of that. But when it comes to economics, in terms of we go, you know, like, no, 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 we don't go there. Well, you know what? Grow up and go there. Because I've been saying for a long time, <clears throat> anything that, that is a public issue will ultimately make it to your private door. I didn't know it was going to make it to your private door as horrifically as it does now, but I used to always use the example, good luck with all that green juice and gluten-free because they're poisoning the air. They're poisoning the water. So you can only go so far trying to stay within your own little while I'll eat healthy, right? So economics, we have an economic system and have had for the last 40 years, which is one in which the, uh, the idea is that market principles should guide public policy. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that there was in the 1980s this, this economic theory called trickle-down economics. And it was the idea that all that corporations should owe is financial responsibility to its stockholders. And the idea was that stockholders would then make a lot more money, government wouldn't regulate, they wouldn't care about anything, but how do I make more money? How do I make more money? How do I make more money for the stockholders? So that means squeeze everything you can from workers. Squeeze everything you can out of workers. Don't have to worry about the environment. Don't have to worry about any of that stuff. All you have to do is worry about making money for your stockholders. And then the justification for that was that the stockholders would become job creators. They would make <clears throat> create all these jobs so all that money would trickle down. And then it would lift all boats. It did not lift all boats. After 40 years, I think the jury is in. After 40 years, we can recognize that not only did it not lift all vote boats, it left millions of people without even a life vest. It has created a massive transfer of wealth in the United States into the hands of 1% of our population. 1% now owes more money than the bottom 90%. This is the largest income inequality in almost 100 years. Now, this is, you know, some people might say, oh, she's just talking economics. I'm not into that. This is not just economic data. This is human lives we're talking here. We're talking millions of people who do not have health insurance because we do not have universal health care. We are talking about mil tens of millions of people who are so burdened by their college loans that they can't even imagine ever doing what they really want to do with their lives because they thought they needed to get that education to live their dreams. But in order to live their dreams, they got that education education, but now they owe so much on college loans, they can't imagine getting a job doing what they want to do because they have to get a job doing what they don't want to do to pay for the college loans that they took out in order to do what they wanted to do. This is tens of millions of people here we're talking about. So on one hand, we talk about our being a capitalist system, which is great, but how can you be a capitalist system? How can you be a capitalist if you don't have any capital? Too many people can't get into the game. So this is real lives of people who, who can't afford a higher education or got the higher education, have the health, have the have the, the loans, et cetera. So what this is called, and then you add to that, and as part of that, aligned with that, <clears throat> is the fact that over the last few decades, and it's all part of the same mentality, we have withdrawn investment in, in public issues, such as science, such as preparing for pandemics. We had 47 pandemic centers and 37 of them were closed. We had been diminishing our, our money for something like the um, Centers for Disease Control. So what has happened is that the whole system has been built on, well, you know, the people who have enough money to handle it, whatever the problem is, will be okay. We were, uh, we were um, skating on very thin ice. And to be honest, Shannon, you know, this time it was uh, a pandemic, but we have to be grown ups about this. It's re we must really mature in our thinking. It could have been just as easily a nuclear disaster, could have just as easily been a weather catastrophe. Right. And girls must be women now. <clears throat> no more ditzy stuff. And the, all those little boys need to start realizing they're men right now because if we, on the other side of this, don't address all the, all the various issues where we have been so similarly organized, then God help us all because the next catastrophe could conceivably be even worse. I'd like to share this comment that came in because I think it's it's worth sharing. Susie McCartney says, I find that economics relates to humans being able to make a livelihood. 
to actualize themselves by meeting their basic needs and can thereby entertain greater loving kindness. <clears throat> Many people cannot do this when on survival mode. And that's what uh, I could not agree more. That's exactly what I'm saying. The real economics. Now, there's another way to do economics. And that's that what should be guiding our economic our economic policies is not short term profit for a small group of corporate stockholders. What should be guiding our economic policy is whatever would make people thrive, like Susie is saying. So if people get if people have health care and don't have to worry about that, and people can have a higher education that will help them actualize their dreams and they don't have to worry about these college loans, they're gonna be more excited at work. They're gonna be better employers, they're gonna be better employees, they're gonna be living their dreams, starting companies. Access to capital, capital is better for capitalism. Right. Access to capital is what the, would, would free up our system. We'd have a better economy, a more vibrant economy, a more abundant yeah, economy. Be, yeah. Absolutely, because people aren't living in stress. We have so many millions of people living with chronic economic tension and anxiety. You know, I read recently that um, I want to say it was close to 90% of Americans have less than $400 squirreled away for a time. Okay, now life. let's think about that. So what you're saying is true, that we have 40% of Americans who could not afford a $400 unexpected expenditure. Right. Guess what? That day has come. Yeah. That's what this pandemic represents. Right. And our the bailout gives them a $1,200 one-time right. one payment. What you just said first of all that's an example of, of, a, of an economy that is so skating on thin ice like i said and then the the people who are the purveyors of that economic system have been going around talking about how good the economy is i ran for president you might probably know and i said good for who yeah. good for who what do you mean it's good yeah i'm a philosopher be careful with the word good around me well, so I think how do we, instead of, you know, feeling victimized by the system that we're part of, or, you know, first it's being victim of victimized by coronavirus or COVID or the situation that's happening. And now the economic fallout that's coming, um, you know, how can we shift from that victim mentality to a place of empowerment and empowered action? The first thing we do is not kid ourselves and stop pretending we're victims. We let this happen. So that's the first thing taking responsibility. Thank you. So yeah. the truth is, as Abraham Lincoln said, there's not that much evil that any government can do as long as the people remain vigilant. And what he was referring to is the fact that every two years, every member of the House of Representatives is is um, is up for election. Now, because of gerrymandering, gerrymandering and all other vote, essentially voter suppression efforts, it's hard. But if anybody watching right now doesn't know who their congressperson is, isn't involved in the upcoming race, not just every every congressperson will be running this year in some states because it's staggered. In some states, there will be senatorial races. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously we have a presidential. So none of this ooh, politics doesn't matter. None of this saying, well, I'm not into that. Other people are handling that. Those days have got to be over. Yeah. No more ditzy. No more justifying political disengagement with this counterfeit idea of what spirituality is. Because there is no religious or spiritual path anywhere that gives any of us a pass on addressing the suffering of other sentient beings. And, and I also, I don't know how many of the people watching are women, but there like is no, okay, there is no vortex on this planet more potentially transformative than the awakening of the American woman. Because our power, we're, we're the most powerful country in the world. And if American women say, oh, this is going to change now, it would change. But we, I have felt for a long time, Shannon, that people who are part of the higher consciousness, personal transformation movement, we are the last people who should be standing on the sidelines. We should be the biggest grown-ups in the room. Because if you know what changes one heart, you're the one who knows what changes the world. That's why I said to you before, it's not a matter of transitioning. It's a matter of expanding our minds to thinking all these principles we're all talking about all the time. They don't just apply to our personal. They also apply to our collective. And the container for our collective behavior is called politics. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much. I mean, that was that was great. And I think, you know. I, for one, taking responsibility and really showing up for what I believe in. And, um, you know, I, I it does I need to bring it bigger than just, you know, I, I love your kind of let's go big. It's time to show up and grow up. So and I have three daughters at home and I'll be definitely sharing this <laughs> with 
with them. So, you know, my 15 year old said to me one time, you know, mom, my generation, we're, we're sick of it. And we're probably just going to burn it down. And I'd love for her to take that energy and burn it down in the right way and really take responsibility. So um, anything else you'd like to share on that? No, you can ask me whatever you want to ask me. But I... <laughs> so we talked the big picture, but let's maybe bring it in to the small picture about what's happening, you know, within ourselves as we're kind of quarantined either forcefully or self-quarantined, um, you know, to be respectful of those around us. Well, this it's, is very difficult, isn't it? It's a very difficult time for all of us. Yeah. Um, but most of us, I know for me, and for I assume for most of the people who are watching right now, it's nothing compared to some of the despair that millions and millions of our fellow citizens are, are experiencing. We already had 40 million hungry people in the United States. We have 93 million people living near poverty. We have 40 million hungry, uh, people in poverty and consider between 36 to 40 million people living in hunger. We already have a situation with this virus where the food banks are becoming overwhelmed as we speak. I was reading an article that in Vietnam, they've actually put these ATM like machines on the streets and they are dispensing free rice. And I've been talking on my social media recently about how all these these uh, these um, national guards should be organized right right now for food, free food delivery. That's what I'm very very concerned about. We are living at a time where there are two things. Well, there's so many things going on, but one is our own personal stress around all this. You know, we're a very adrenaline driven society, addictively so, and a lot of the moving and going and doing that we do is a way of avoiding at the deepest level some of the work that we're doing. You and I were talking before uh, the program began about how you're feeling, I'm feeling, most people I know are experiencing not just the fear, but the depth of conversations and communication. And I know in my life I'm seeing it, looking at myself in some deeper ways because it's kind of like an enforced vipassana meditation where you can't. There's nothing to look at except the mirror here. Hello. So there's tremendous growth potential in terms of our own uh, enlightenment and our own personal growth, but also there's a connection here between that self purification and the growth into who we need to be to make the changes we need to make on the other side of this. We need to reimagine the world. The world is not going to be the same. But it's just like when you go through a personal tragedy and you know that you're not going to be the same, you're going to be either bitter or you're going to be better. Our country will not be the same. It will either be going in a more authoritarian direction or in a more enlightened direction. We need to make a shift. This is all I talked about in my presidential campaign, that we need to make, needed to make a shift from an economic bottom line to a humanitarian bottom line. And so we have a lot to think about right now, reimagining, thinking about what we want this country to look like. The people who would like to use this as an opportunity to go in a more authoritarian direction, they are busy already. Already they have been cutting environmental regulations. Already, they have been floating ideas about suspending certain constitutional rights. Already, things are happening which have real voter suppression elements in them. We need to wake up. We need to stand up. We need to rise up. And we need to show up. I love that. So they're getting ready. And so uh, the spiritual camp, we have to get ready, too. You know, oh, we please. To I mean, this, this, this is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love that phrase, bitter or better, um, you know, because there is a collective trauma happening. There's a personal trauma by, you know, what's happening within your home or your life, but there's a, a generational collective trauma that's taking place and, and how we show up on the other side. Um, I love that. So, so, you know, another thing we talked about was how important it is to be responsible for our thoughts and feelings about this. Um, and I think you've really, you know, touched <clears throat> on that, but, but really kind of owning your you're part of what's happening here. It's not so much the virus anymore as it's really this, what's going to happen in the long term. Um, so, uh, so I'd love to c go into approaching this situation again, you know, really from a, a deeper, well, 
How, I guess we really unpacked a lot. I'm looking at my notes over here, but anything else you'd like to share? I know we discussed kind of maybe doing a meditation as well. Um, There's a book I read not long ago by a man named Michael Lewis. If you've seen the movie, The Big Short, which was a great film, it was written by him. Mm -hmm. And this book is called The Fifth Risk. And it's an excellent book. It was written before the coronavirus pandemic, but what it's about totally shines a light on how this happened. The book is about the fact that along with this way that we've had of moving the resources of this country into the hands of corporate power because unlimited corporate uh, power has been wielded uh, for financial, uh, financial influence on our government so that we have become less a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, to a government of, by, and for these huge multinational corporate interests. Now, I'm not saying that these corporate interests don't have a right to be. I'm not an anti-capitalist, actually. It's just that we have developed a form of capitalism over the last four decades, which is untethered to ethical and moral consideration. And so capitalism must reclaim its conscience. And since it has such a uh, undue influence on our government, it's the only way government and public policy will reclaim its conscience. Now, in, in keeping with that, we have withdrawn resources from such things as caring for the common good related to things like just in case a pandemic happens. Because if you, if you try to pass a piece of legislation saying, well, we really should give more money to make sure the Centers for Disease Control is um, fully funded, there'd be some legislator who'd say, well, why should we do that? And then somebody else would say, well, we should do it to keep the people safe. And then that other person would say, well, who's going to make money off that? Mm -hmm. Which of my donors is going to support me in that? And this is what happens when the, when the American people are not vigilant. You know, Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson said that the only safe repository uh, for power in the United States is in the hands of the people. But your power is not in your hands if it's not in your head. Power is not in your hands if it's not in your heart. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote my book, Politics of Love, because I think a lot of people, you know, smart people, it's not like we're stupid, but a lot of people have just been so uninvolved in politics and so for so long, they've like, I don't even know where to start. So I wrote my book, Sealing the Soul of America and Politics of Love for the quote unquote spiritual types uh, to have more of an understanding of politics. And I think also for political types to have more understanding of how spirituality applies. I would be very interested. I have not read it, but it's on my list now because um, I am one of those people. I will fully take responsibility for being one of those people. And, um, you know, and I'm I'm ashamed and ready to, to say, you know, what kind of America am I leaving my children? You know, I want to make sure that, that it's better. It's not bitter. It's better. So that makes me happy. Um, OK, so I have one a comment that that came in. How does the universal law of attraction apply to this if it's constantly operational? Hmm. Shouldn't be shouldn't the focus be independently inward, always at all times, regardless of outside data? Okay. So we need to really get over this. This whole thing about the law of attraction is is all based on how I can get what I want. So can we like grow past that now? That's, you know, in The Course in Miracles, they talk about the difference between magic and miracles. The law of attraction is magic. It's like, how can I use my mind to get what I want? The miracle worker is not coming from a, how can I get what I want? Because the miracle worker is coming from the realization we are already everything. The miracle worker is not saying, how can I use miracle metaphysical principle to get what I want? It's like using God as your errand boy or something. The miracle worker is just saying, how can I be of service to love? How can I wake up this morning and God use my hands, use my feet, use the things I say, use the things I do? How can I be a vessel and a conduit of love? Ultimately, you only get what you give. So that cannot just mean an inward turning. If you see a hungry child, you think you're being some spiritual person by ignoring that hungry child? Well, I got to tell you something. 12,000 children starve on this planet. No, 12, no, thank God, not 12,000 children. But 12,000 people starve on this planet every day. And it's not like we don't have enough food. We have, in, in the United States today, we support a 
uh, the, the, with aerial support in exchange for a $360 billion arms deal, we support the Saudi Arabians in a genocidal war against Yemen. Tens of thousands of people have starved, including children whose pictures are all over the internet. So none of this talking, we're so spiritual, and we do the law of attraction when we're conveniently not looking at what's going on. Yes, those things are outer-oriented, but there ain't no love when you're ignoring a hungry child. And there's no spirituality either. Well, this is definitely I feel like I've become the, the tough grandmother. I know. Well, you know, we, we need it. We need, uh, America needs a tough grandmother. We need to. Yeah, um, sometimes we have to, girls just have to say to each other, wake up, wake up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's what the comments are saying. Yes, yes, yes. Everyone is really, um, you know, in agreement about what the message that you're sharing. And um, I know I, for one, have enjoyed it very much. So now I Thank see you. one question, if I may, from Please. Jenna. Sure, that sure. says, besides voting, what other measures do you find effective? Mm. May I speak to that? Uh, Absolutely. Is it okay? We right now, people are going through their primaries, and the same kind of suppression and manipulation that goes on on the presidential level also goes on on the congressional level. You can look at my list of candidates on Mary. Go to Marianne2020.com. I left that up. And you can see the list of candidates that I support. This is the deal. The candidates that stand for the principles that I'm talking about here, in general, have less money. They tend to be those who are not the ones supported by the big corporate interests. Therefore, they're not supported by the establishment political interests. We have such good people in this country, in every single area. We have the people, the projects, the practices that would know what to do to, to handle every problem we have. The problem is that we have a government that does more to fund the problem creators than to fund the problem solvers. And that's why you and I have to get involved. Become, find out who's running for Congress in your congressional district. And you know what? You're going to have to, a lot of the same issues are playing out on local levels right. that are and on state levels you know when was the last time you went to a city council meeting or did you ever go to a city council meeting we have to become women who say to the people that we love i'm going to a city council <laughs> meeting on thursday night i want to go with me. <laughs> that's got to be a hot thursday night thing to do seriously because you know this has just all been going on we just haven't been looking so yeah. So, okay, so besides voting, show up to meetings, get involved. Yeah, show up to meetings, find out who's running for Congress, find out who's running for Congress in your, in your district. Look at, the, look at the things they stand for. Check out, you can, you know, there are a lot of things on my, if you, I, I kept up Marianne2020.com because even though obviously I'm not running anymore, there are a lot of issues there that you can read about uh, that I think a lot of people would find helpful. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely be sure to drop that in there comments afterwards as well yeah this is interesting yeah we need more women in politics i see these comments it's wonderful so um wonderful with this direction and you know what I, I if i may um, please having run myself it's not just you have to be in politics first of all we're all in politics because politics just it comes from a latin root means the politeia it means all of us when you see candidates who stand for what you want you have to support them because until we get the money out of politics like when i when i ran my can my campaign uh raised seven million dollars now in a presidential campaign race that's almost not very much at all but still seven million dollars so what i saw was how many people out there did send money and support but i found that the higher consciousness community just doesn't have the 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 habits of political involvement so it was going to take more than sending a donation it was going to take talking to your friends putting it on your social media making videos about it we're in the habit of being spectators and Very also true. another thing if you look at how president trump was elected the people who supported him didn't care that he wasn't the establishment's choice they just supported him too many people would say to me during my race, well, I just, you know, I'd, I'd love it if you could win. I just, she can't win. Well, she wins if 
you vote for her. You know, she has a louder voice if you vote for her. And um, I also felt that uh, during my campaign, people would say things like, um, Marianne, you're just, it's great what you're talking about, but that's our future. And I would say, how much time do you think we have? And I think what we're going through with the pandemic right now demonstrates um, the reality that we don't have time. We must change. We must change now. Well, and like you said, we're, we're used to being spectators. Well, we're giving away our power right away before we Absolutely. even try to do it. We're just Absolutely. It and that, right. And that's why before it's like we're not victims here. Yeah. We yeah. co-created this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So how do we get money out of politics? That was another comment. Well, okay. So that's a tough one. Uh, we now have a, several years ago, there was a court case called Citizens United, which I'm sure most of your people recognize. And Citizens United essentially gave unlimited uh, financial power uh, to corporations and corporate money to just flood the airwaves with all of the, in, in all the ways that they can influence politicians. With the current uh, Supreme Court that we have, it is not reasonable to assume that Citizens United will be overturned anytime soon because we have a five to four court. Uh, five of them are very in support of corporate power. The other four are more in support of the people's power in this, this struggle. Uh, what we're going to need to do now is a, a constitutional amendment. That's the only way to really. Now, there are different uh, states doing things which are really good. There's one, I think, uh, Washington State, Oregon is doing interesting things uh, called democracy dollars, where every citizen is given a certain amount of money that they can give to political candidates. But I think we need a constitutional amendment uh, in order to get rid of money in politics. I'll give you an example. If somebody reads my uh, Instagram post today, imagine if our Congress was made up of authors, artists, teachers, scientists, healers, yogis, and philosophers. Just allow yourself to hold that. Could we be in any worse position? So we're going to have to lift the veil from in front of our eyes, this idea that somebody has to have a certain kind of business mentality in order to serve in politics. You know, I saw that in my campaign. What makes you qualified? Well, first of all, Thomas Jefferson had a lot to do with it because the U.S. Constitution says that in order to be president, you have to have been born here, you had to have lived here for 14 years, and you have to be over 35. Now, that was interesting. They didn't say you had to have been a congressperson. Didn't say you had to have been a senator. Didn't say you had to have been a mayor. Why? Because they were leaving it up to every generation to determine for itself the skill set that they felt was necessary to navigate the times in which they live. We have bought into this delusional idea of what you have to be to be qualified to be in politics, which is interesting because basically what the system is saying is that in order to get us out, in order to be qualified to get us out of this ditch, you had to have spent a lot of years entrenched within the system that drove us into this ditch. Doesn't Hello. make any sense. <laughs> well, if it doesn't make any sense, we gotta like act on what we know. Yeah. Wow. I think that you know, I think that's interesting because I think we know this is not an era of data collection. We all know. We all I'm not saying we're perfect people, but I know in my own life, when I'm not who I should be and when I make big mistakes and all that. It's not about things I didn't know. It's about a space I was not inhabiting given what I know. And that's where the personal growth comes in. Are we willing to own what we know? You know, we all know we're not stupid people. And anything you don't know, you can look it up on Google. The issue is, am I willing to be the man or the woman who really makes a stand for what I know? That's where we are right now. That's so well said. Um, well, thank you so much for for meeting with us today. And you know, would you like to leave our our audience with a if you'd like to take any more comments, or if you'd like to lead with a leave us with a meditation? Completely up to you. Um, sure. Well, let's at this moment let's say a prayer for the world. Yes. 
at this moment of agony and anguish for so many, at this moment of grief, this moment of fear. We ask that the hand of God be upon all those who are sick, all those who are grieving. We pray that the hand of God be upon all the doctors and nurses, those doing heroic work of first response. And we atone in our hearts. We atone for the irreverence, the irreverence towards the planet, the irreverence towards people, the irreverence towards the animals that we participated in simply by not participating. And dear God, we know that we have to change. We know that we can't solve the problems of the world from the level of thinking we were at when we created them. And so our prayer tonight, dear God, please change us. Open our eyes that we might see what before we had not seen. Open our minds and open our hearts. Forgive us, forgive this country, forgive human civilization for the heartlessness that too often influences our decisions and our behavior. Correct us and heal us. Grant us a new beginning. We atone for the past that we might miraculously experience a new and different future. Where we have been weak, please make us strong. Where we have been confused, please make us clear. Where we have been harsh, please make us gentle. Where we have thought only of ourselves, help us to think of others. Where we have been filled with fear, please fill us with love so great that no fear can enter. Grant us that love and use us to extend it into the lives of others. Pave a way forward, dear God, that we might move beyond the scourge and there might be a new dawn brought forth with you by us. And so it is, we all say, Amen. Thank you very much thank you so much stay safe and stay sane and thank you just spread love god bless you thank you so much for having me on